I didn't know this was corporate finance uh, central, the non, no free lunch, but uh, I do have some accounting measurements and some multiples here. So this is um, um, joint work with uh, uh, actually a student here, uh, Jung, she's sitting right here uh, in accounting, and Partha, which used to be faculty here. Um, there's no paper yet. There's currently still working on it. And one sec, this works. Um, so let's, let's talk about what uh, I guess is used commonly a lot. One of these uh, common measurements in corporate finance and asset pricing, uh, investing, is multiples. They're used for valuations. We know the book to market, earnings price ratios, uh, things like that. You basically take the, um, I say, average multiple in an industry. Uh, take it, multiply it by the earnings of the firm that you want to value, and you get an approximation of what the firm is worth. And so the way they work is basically they use some sort of market price, stock price, or overall value, and some accounting figure, either earnings, book values, uh, revenues, and, and some others. Well, the market value is the same everywhere. The market values, it's the discounted cash flows. There's no difference between the different firms. At the end of the day, we want to, we would just discount the cash flows. That's the market value. But the firms do use different accounting. They do use, they can choose different accounting in some cases. They have to use different accounting in other cases. So if you're using multiples across firms, which are used to compare firms and things like that, can we do, really do that? Are they really that comparable? And. Let me give you some example of what I mean. Um, some of you just started with, uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, some of you just started with the accounting classes, so uh, let me discuss this briefly. Uh, one of them is just inventory management. Uh, first in, first out, or FIFO, uh, and LIFO, LIFO meaning last in, first out. What's the difference? First in, first out meaning it's the first TV that comes into Costco is also the first TV sold out. Last in, first out means the last TV comes in, that comes into Costco is considered the first one being sold to customers. That will result in different earnings for different firms depending on what they use. I think the, the cleanest example is actually in the oil and gas industry. Firm can choose whether they use full cost or what's known as successful effort. So if they go and look for oil or gas somewhere, you can either treat this as an expense because you're not sure you're going to find anything. That will be the successful effort. Or you can capitalize all the costs. So treat it as an asset, as an investment. So you'll have two basically firms doing the exact same thing. One of them is capitalizing the cost, going to be an asset on the book. The other one is going to call it an expense. It's a pure choice by the firm. They don't have to do anything. That, they have to be consistent over time. But they just choose one or the other. Uh, another one which is a bit more subtle is R&D. R&D is probably one of the more problematic because it's, it, the choices are, uh, the firm doesn't exactly have a, an accounting choice, but it has a real choice to make and given that choice, the accounting is set. If a firm does R&D on its own, Pfizer, they're looking for a drug or anything like that, that is an expense. It's, even though it's an investment, the firm will treat it as an investment from an accounting standpoint it's an expense. It's going to be on the income statement as a loss or as an expense. They don't have a choice on that. But if the firm either buys a subsidiary that has done the R&D before or just buys the patent or anything like that, that is an asset on the books. Okay? So we have, again, based on the choices, we're going to have two different accounting measurements for the same thing. Um, so let me just show you this in, in, in an example, um, a simple one. I'm not going to go that technical into this, but um, if you take your accounting classes, you'll see this. So I have a startup that is formed on January 1st, 2001, uh, with $2,500 in cash, a $500 loan. Uh, the firm uh, incurs $200 operational cost in 2001. Now I'm going to have two cases. First one. The firm develops the R&D on its own for $300. This means internally they have to expense it. The firm did it. The moment the firm does it, it has to expense this. In 2002 and 2003, the firm generates $1,000 in revenues and $400 in operating costs. This doesn't include the R&D expense. The second case, the firm actually buys the R&D from someone else. Someone else did the R&D. They buy the patent. Uh, 
the firm assesses the useful life of the asset for two years. In 2002 and 2003, the firm generates $1,000 in revenues and excluding the R&D, $400 in costs. I hope you would agree with me that the market value for these two cases is exactly the same. Discounted cash flow. They spend 300, they make 600 every year after that, plus the 200 operational costs. It's exactly the same cash flows for both of these firms. The only difference is, is whether the firm decided to do the R&D on its own or buy the R&D from someone else. I don't want to go through the full example. I just want you to focus on a few things. I want to give you some time uh, for questions if you, if you have them. So I have on the top, I have the balance sheet. And on the bottom, I have the income statement. So the balance sheet basically says what the firm has at any point in time. In January 1st, 2000, the firm has 3,000 in some tangible assets of cash, a 500 loan, and 2,500 is the firm's uh, equity. At the end of that period, in case A, remember in case A what they did was they spent the R&D internally. They don't have an asset, an intangible. They can't write it up. What they have to do is write it as an expense in the income statement. This is this $300. What happens, again, in 2001, uh, revenues are zero, $200 expense, I guess, to start the company up. So they have a, an overall loss of 500 At the end of the period, this is December 31st, they got 2500 in cash. Uh, they lost, again, this $500. And their equity goes down to 2000 Fast forward again to, two th uh, to December uh, 31st, 2002. Still, again, no intangible assets. They don't have a patent on their books. They have $1,000 revenues, 400 costs. They make 600 every year. Overall income is $700 for this firm. Let's do the second case where they buy the R&D from someone else. If they buy the R&D from, some from someone else, then it's an asset. There is no R&D expense here. It's an asset up there. It's the intangible assets. That $300 now went up. It's now on the balance sheets. It's not a loss for the firm. It's not an expense for the firm. So they have bigger book values, higher assets, just because they decided to buy uh, the R&D. By the way, Pfizer does a lot of that. They buy uh, a lot of the R&D compared to doing it on their own. So. Uh, Again, they have the $200 expense, so they only lose $200. If I compare that with above, that was a loss of $500 before. Looking at what happens the year after, you have to depreciate $300 for two years. That's $150 every year. So that was $600 before. There's an added expense of $150 amortization or depreciation of that. Uh, patent of 300, you see the 300 goes down to 150 and then zero. That's the amortization. So they lose 200 in the first year and then 450 every year. Go back to the initial slide. I said the market values are the same. Overall profit is the same. It is the exact same cash flows. But now let's look at the multiples. If we had them, I, I, I don't have the market value here, but I have, if I use a PE multiple, here I have a negative 500, uh, and here I have negative 200. Before I had 600, now I have 200, 450. So if I use the same market value and I look at the multiples of these two firms, they're going to have a different multiple. But they're exact same firm. They're exact same cash flows, exact same value. So fortunately, uh, we can fix that. But let me look at another two ratios before. Just It doesn't have to be market values. If you just look at our return on assets, <coughs> return on equity. In the first case, remember the loss was bigger at the beginning. They got a negative return on assets of minus 16 or well, 17 and minus 20% of return on equity. The second case, the return on asset was minus 6.67. Remember, they had higher assets. They bought the R&D. Lower ROE, but then in the future, they got lower profitabilities. Look at how different these ratios are for two identical firms. This is what I want you to remember. These, are de these firms are identical. They just have different accounting, and you got different ratios. So there is a fix. 
What's the fix? You can basically treat R&D the way the firm treat them economically, as an investment. We know how much the firm spends on R&D. It's available on any database that you want, but if you look, we open Edgar and you look, read a 10K of the firm, they spell out exactly what was the R&D expense. As investors, we can take the balance sheet and income statement and modify them any way we want to. So we go back five years. In this example, we say go back five years. Take all of the R&D expenses and treat them as if the firm actually treated them as investments and put them as assets. You go back and you have your own accounting, to use these terms, reformulate the balance sheet, redo an income statement. That's just the formula. I don't want to, um, I mean, if you take earnings quality and fundamental analysis, uh, uh, You'll do that, uh, otherwise, uh, Chris has sat in my class and he's willing to teach anyone who's interested. Uh, that's the part of the no free lunch part, that says no. Um, so, and if you, it's just, you can just plug this in, you're gonna have it, uh, all of these uh, different assets and liabilities uh, and different earnings as well. We're gonna take the earnings out of the income statement, put them on the, the R&D expense, out of the income statement, put them on a balance sheet, and instead, put. A depreciation expense. So we're going to have new earnings, new book values. So that part you can get from an accounting class. Now I'm trying to get, so what, it, in this paper we're trying to show you what's the value of it. So let's start a little bit with, um, I guess, uh, we, we deal with large databases, so look at this as a quant, uh, if you will, a quant investment. We've shown in the past that firms with High book to markets have high future returns, and firms with low book to markets have lower future returns. So you're taking uh, the finance classes, uh, you might have seen this. So they, at the end of the day, go long on the high book to market firms, go sh short on the low book to market firms, and you get a spread in returns. It's pretty straightforward, the idea, what's the market to book ratio? Uh, why would the market value be higher than the book value? Right, the market reflects the future discounted cash flows. The book value reflects what you already made. Well, the market means that if the market is really high compared to the book value, it means they expect you to do a lot more in the future. They expect the profits to be a lot higher. Um, that's really the difference between the market and the book. Also remember there's the discount rate uh, component in this. Future uh, earnings have to be discounted. So again, Prior studies did find this. Firms with high book to market have higher future returns. Also, firms with high book to markets have lower future earnings. This is basically what, what they found. So we have here, we sort for portfolios into five based on the book to market. So we take all firms that are tra publicly traded. We have the book values from their 10K. We got the market values from uh, we use uh, Chris, but you can use uh, Yahoo, finance.yahoo and get the same outcome. Use the book to market ratio, sort them from low to high. High stocks, you see that 1.3%, this is monthly. Low stocks, low book to market stocks have 0 0.77. High minus low, low, so that's the long short trading strat strategy, gives you 0.53%. That is per month, so for for a year, this is a pretty uh, high returns. CAPM alpha, basically if you control for the market, uh, above market, you'll make 0.63. So, since we're dealing with R&D mostly, we did, all of, uh, we did several adjustments, but we basically focused on the R&D adjustments. We took the 1990s as our, basically, time period to test. So the unadjusted book to market during the 1990s, if you just use the book to market ratio, go long on high book to market, short on low book to market, <coughs> that spread in return is 0 0.29, see over here. Cap M alpha is 0 0.76. Use the formulas that I gave you and have a new book value. Create a new book value. Now calculate the book to market ratio with that new book value. Do a high minus low you get 0 0.53. It's not double, but it's close to that, just by adjusting the book values. 
What we've done now, I want to go back to what we've done. We've done, the book to market ratios is done for comparison. I'm trying to buy stocks at the high book to market because I believe they have, uh, gonna have higher future returns. They're used for comparison, but we had different accounting for these different firms, so we were sorting firms incorrectly. When you adjust the book values, you're now gonna have all the firms on the same footing. If you bought the R&D or you did the R&D on your own, you're gonna look the same with my formula. If you invested in PP&E instead of R&D, it will look the same after this formula. So what, you, what it, the idea is to have comparable ratios. Once you do that, your rate of return increases significantly. Even the cap M alpha goes up to almost 1% a month during that time period. This is the difference. It's about 24 um, basis points here, 18 after the cap M. This is a very, and it, again, this, this is the T statistic above, way above two. Um, so definitely this has a huge, uh, makes a huge difference in the 1990s. I don't have time to show you all the results in all the different time periods. The big, big impact is in the 1990s. If there's another tech boom or anything like that, I expect the results to be uh, as strong in other periods. Uh, in other, if you go before 1990s, this doesn't make that much of a big deal. We also want to make sure that we don't have a, just a small stock effect. Uh, we know that some of these small stocks are more, you know, the startups and things like that. We want to make sure we're not just capturing that. Um, so we sorted firms into small stocks and big stocks, and we did the exact same exercise. Um, if you look, uh, the small stocks in the unadjusted book to market will give you almost 1% um, high minus low. Per, that is a per month. If you adjust the book to market, you get up to 1.35. This is almost a 30, 40 uh, percent increase in the returns just by adjusting the ratios to be more comparable. Okay. Um, high minus low, the impact again is to be more accurate. It's 0.38 and 0.30 uh, on the small stock. It is marginally lower, but still very significant on large and big stocks. So even if you take the uh, S&P 500 and you do the book to market ratio within the S&P 500, this will still make a difference. So that's the first part about what the book to market is supposed to say, right? There's the discount rate part, but there's also the earnings part. Firms with high market values compared to the book are supposed to have higher future growth and higher future profits. People did find that actually. I think um, um, Steve Penman in 1900, he's in our accounting group. He has a paper that actually shows this. What do they find? You basically run a regression on future return on equity. Return on equity meaning take the earnings of the firm divided by the beginning uh, values, book values. So the firm's equity. That will give you the return on equity. You take the future return on equity, regress on the book to market. If firms with high market values, which is in the nom denominators, have higher future profitability, B should be negative. If you ran this regression from 1963 to 1991, you do get this negative. It's negative, it's statistically significant, uh, that is meaning firms that have very high market values compared to their book values will actually have higher future profitability. If you run this regression after 1991, it's insignificant in terms of the T-statistic. It's all way below uh, what we call a cutoff of 1.6 or 2. Uh, in fact, if, from 91 to 2001, it's actually positive. Uh, it kind of shows you that firms that have higher market values actually have lower future profits, uh, which seems very strange. Uh, you get a little bit of a negative relation from 2001 to 2011, uh, but statistical significant, we're talking about something uh, fairly low. Now we're gonna adjust the book to market and adjust the earnings. 
What I mean by the earnings, the earnings now, are, we're not going to take the R&D expense. We're going to take it out. That's part of the book values now. The earnings would not have these expenses in them. If you notice up there, uh, this is from 91 to 2011. We're not that good still in one year ahead. But the book to market ratio, five years out, still has a negative relation with future return on equity. Again, higher market values does mean higher future profits if you do not consider R&D to be an expense. That's pretty much what we're doing in this study. If you don't consider R&D to be an expense, the firms with the higher market values do indeed have higher future profits. This lasts all the way to 2001, 2011, so the, uh, these effects aren't going away. Right, so this, this issue keeps on going on. As long as there's R&D, as long as there's a significant amount of R&D comparatively in the market, these adjustments are going to make a difference. When R&D was a small portion of what the US economy does before the 1990s, uh, this doesn't make any difference. If you start going from 91 and above, this makes a big difference. Okay. Uh, to conclude, uh, Again, we, are use, we use these financial ratios in all sorts of places for benchmarking mostly. Very few of us actually try and do a whole valuation of a firm, just book, the book to market or earnings price or something like that. That's the value of the firm and that's it. However, we do use them as benchmarks. We use them in all sorts of places. Uh, and my biggest issues with this is we use one number that is the same across all firms, which is the market value. And another value, which is an accounting value that is different across firms based on what the firm's rules are, or sometimes choices in the case of the oil and gas industry. People aren't oblivious to this. What I'm, we're putting in fourth here is, I guess, a systematic way to deal with it such that it takes all of these effects out. Okay? What, all of the adjustments that I'm talking about, just to be clear, are not allowed under GAAP. That is generally accepted accounting principles. Firms cannot report you these numbers. You will have to do them yourself. So you can modify financial statements to be more comparable. You can have more comparable ratios. We'll give you better insights. This is what we're getting uh, from this, uh, especially if, again, R&D explodes uh, back again, which I hope it does um, in the future. Okay. Thank you.